This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. All right, I'm glad uh, to be able to share with you the remaining part of the message that I began last Sunday. And so if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, please turn with me this morning to the book of Revelation chapter number 12. Revelation chapter 12, that's where we'll find our text this morning, but it's a continuation of the message from last Sunday. The title of my message last Sunday was Lies from the Father of Lies, and this morning the title of my message is More Lies from the Father of Lies. So if you're able to, please stand with me out of respect for God's Word as I read our text found in Revelation chapter 12, verse number 9. Here's what the Bible says, speaking of the devil. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. As I said last week in the introduction, this is a future event during the tribulation period that is still yet to come. After the church has been raptured out of here and the world is going through that seven years of tribulation period that we talked about, studied about when we were in the book of Revelation on Sunday evenings a while back. But this verse is about the person that we know as the devil, Satan. I say person, he's a personality, he is an angel that was created by God. He's, he's not a human being, but he's a person, he's a personality And the Bible says of him that he is the deceiver. He is, as we saw in John chapter 8 last week, a liar and the father of lies. Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning. He is a liar and the father of it. So the devil, Satan, the serpent, the dragon, whichever name you want to call him by, he is real. He's a real person. He's not just like the the Star Wars, may the force be with you, and he's the bad side of the force. No, he's a person, and all those angels that were cast out or uh, chose to follow him, a third of the angels, they're personalities too. And they all desire to hurt God But they can't touch our God. So the only way they can hurt God is to hurt the heart of God. And that is by what they do to mankind. And so this morning I want to continue the message we began last week. Speaking of the lies from the father of lies. So this is more lies from the father of lies. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you'd help our minds and our hearts to focus upon you upon your word, and Lord, upon the adversary, the devil. Lord, and how he seeks to destroy the lives of Christians and lost alike. Lord, may we not fall prey to the deceptions and the lies of this deceiver. We pray that when we leave this place, all of us would be closer to you, and Lord, that we would be more aware of the lies of the devil. That our lives would not end in shipwreck, like so many around us. We pray this in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. And you may be seated. I'll not re-preach last week's message. I'm pretty much going to just pick up where I left off last week, but the, the three lies that we talked about last week of the devil that so many people fall for is that, well, in the garden he said, ye shall not surely die, which was a lie, and ye shall be as gods. Well, those are two lies that were kind of rolled into one there in the Garden of Eden, but they're lies that people are still falling for today. That if you don't follow the God of the Bible, you won't surely die, and and you can become as gods yourself. Every ism and schism and cult and 
false religion out there in some form or another is preaching the same thing today, the same lie, that you can become as God yourself. You can work your way to heaven. It's why every man-made religion out there on the market today is some sort of works-based salvation. You get to heaven by your works. But that's not what the Bible teaches. But the other lie, the second lie we talked about last week is he says, there is no God. And the third lie we talked about last week is, I don't need anything from anybody. I'm just fine on my own. And the devil has deceived many people into believing that they don't need God nor anybody else. And countless lives have been thrown away needlessly because of people believing the lies of the deceiver. I want to pick up there this morning then with yet another lie from the devil. But before I do that, I want to say that you might be sitting there and saying to yourself, well, preacher, I'm already saved. I'm already a Christian. I know that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. What does this have to do with me? Well, obviously, we all know lost people that are still falling for these lies. And if you and I are not aware of these lies that Satan has, then those that we're trying to witness to, we're not going to be as effective in our witnessing to them. But I have to say that even for those that are saved, we are not immune from falling prey to being deceived by the devil ourselves. There are more than a few Christians that have bought into the the worldly thinking, the fleshly thinking that Satan is trying to get people to buy into today. And there are lies that even as a saved person, if I buy into them and I believe them, they will destroy my life as a Christian. I might still end up in heaven because I'm eternally saved, but the rest of my life in this world will be a total shipwreck, as the Apostle Paul prayed he would not be. So as Christians, we ought not think that just because we're saved, we don't have to worry about the lies that the devil has. Because they'll destroy your life just like they'll destroy anyone else's life in this world. And if he destroys your life and your testimony, what's that going to do to those around you that are looking to your testimony? So, lie number one for this morning. I'm not a bad person. After all, I'm as good as the next guy or gal. And isn't that a lie that you... uh, You see in people's lives, even if they don't say it with their mouths sometimes, you can see it by the way they live and by their attitude that I'm as good as the next person. After all, I'm a pretty good person. I guess in all the years of soul winning that I've done, witnessing to people, one of the most common answers I've gotten when I've asked the question, if you died today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? One of the most common answers I've received is, well, I think so. I hope so. After all, I'm a pretty good person. And you know, the reality is we live in the Bible Belt. So most people around us at least have grown up knowing about the Bible. They know about God. They might have even been to Sunday school or vacation Bible school as a child. So even if they don't go to church today, they have a grandma or a grandpa or a a mom or a daddy or somebody who told them about Jesus at some point along the way. And they understand that we, uh, we ought to be different than the world. And so even if they're still lost, they have this thought in their head, well, I'm, you know, I ought to be a good person. Now, you and I know that being a good person doesn't save anyone. But to the lost person, in their minds, many of them, it's whether their good works outweigh the bad works. Now, that's not the truth. That's not what God bases whether we're going to heaven on or not. But in the mind of a lost person, that's what a lot of them think. Do my good works outweigh my bad works? And for many of the people you and I know, having grown up here in the Bible Belt, in Dixie, in the South, there are a lot of people who would say, I think I'm at least better than a lot of people are. I'm a little better person than they are. 
But yet the Bible says we're not to compare ourselves one with each other. No, we're supposed to compare ourselves to the, the holiness of God. And if we compare ourselves to the holiness of God, well, I'm afraid none of us measure up. That's why we all need a Savior. It's why you needed to get saved before you got saved, no matter how good or bad you were. The Bible says in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That is, none of us are perfect, none of us are holy. It's like Miss Mary was talking about this morning in Sunday school. None of us are righteous. We don't measure up to the standard of a perfect, holy, righteous God. In the same chapter of Romans, Paul says in verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all short of being perfect. And because of that, none of us deserve to go to heaven, good or bad. And without a Savior, without accepting Jesus as our Savior, we won't get to heaven because we don't deserve to go there. We're sinners. And no matter how good a person we are in comparison to other people, we're all guilty before a holy, righteous God. In Galatians 2, verse 16, the Apostle Paul said, By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. If you're thinking that God's going to justify you and, and grant you entrance into the pearly gates because of being a good person and having good works or being better than the next guy or gal, you're not going to make it. So that lie that I'm not a bad person is one that has condemned countless millions upon millions and is still doing the same today. It's one of the reasons that you and I should feel compelled to share the gospel with those around us. That you and I shouldn't pick and choose who we're going to witness to. That was one of the things that my youth pastor taught me as a teenager with the rest of the teenagers in our youth group. Don't pick and choose who you're going to witness to. It's not your place to know whether they're saved or not. You have no way of knowing whether they're saved or not. Your job is to give the gospel out. And yet a lot of times we look at the, uh, the, the drug addict or the drunk or uh, the person involved in one immorality or another and, well, we just assume they must be lost. So, you know, we'll, we'll condescend to witness to them. And yet at the same time, there are people all around us that they might not be living in immorality, but they're still lost. And we need to feel more of a compulsion to witness to those around us. Because those who think that they're okay and they're going to make it into heaven because they're not a bad person, they've bought into one of the lies of the deceiver. In fact, being a good person is probably one of the things that will cause the most people to be in heaven one day. Uh, it, I'm sorry, in hell, not in heaven. In Isaiah 64, 6, the prophet Isaiah, speaking for the Lord, says, All our good works are as filthy rags before the Lord. Now, if that's what our good works are, reckon what our bad ones look like to God. If our good works are as filthy rags to God, reckon what the bad ones look like to Him. But it's a lie that has condemned many. I'm not a bad person. After all, I'm as good as the next guy. Here's another lie from the father of lies. I can decide what's right for myself. I don't need anybody else to tell me what's right and wrong. Boy, that's one we hear all the time in today's America. I don't need you or the Bible or the preacher or anybody else to tell me what's right and wrong. I can figure it out for myself. After all, I have my own conscience to follow. I don't need you to dictate to me what's right and wrong. I guess uh, every parent at some point uh, has heard their teenager say, uh, I don't agree, Mama, or I don't agree, Daddy. I can figure out what's right for myself. 
the lost world thinks they have it all figured out. They think that they don't need anybody else's artificial lines to go by. As we talked about a little last week, the problem with that is that God is the Creator. He's not only the one who made us, He's the one by virtue of being the Creator that gets to make the rules for us too. And it is those rules by which we will be judged one day. Not the rules I made up for myself. That analogy I used last week of who wants to play a game with somebody when they know the rules and I don't? I don't want to play that game. But Americans think that they get to make the rules by which they will be judged. You can make your own rules for how you live your life. We're all free to do that. But the awful reality is, no matter what rules I make up, my own set of rules for my life, those aren't the rules I'm going to be judged by one day, Brother Alex. I'm going to be judged by the Creator's rules. Not my rules. I might like my rules better, but they're not the ones I'm going to be judged by one day. So if I convince myself that I can decide for myself what the rules are, I'm only hurting myself. In both Proverbs 14.12 and Proverbs 16.25, the wisdom of Solomon recorded in the pages of this book say the exact same thing. Now, if God says something once, it's important. But if God says something two times exactly the same way, it ought to get our attention. And in those two verses, the Bible says, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of what? Death. That's right. You you know it. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Mankind thinks he's figured it all out. But following man's wisdom, whether it's an individual or, or collectively, either one, following man's wisdom instead of the pages of this book will lead someone to the wrong conclusions and to destruction. The Bible says that man is sinful and deceitfully wicked. The heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Now, if I'm depending on myself to determine what's right and wrong, I'm going to lead myself astray, let alone whoever's following me. It all comes down to what is your final authority? What do you believe is the final arbiter of right and wrong? And there are too many people in America today who are walking around acting as though, believing as though they are the final arbiter of what's right for them. I can decide for myself what's right. And some people base it all on their feelings. I'll be honest with you, I'm probably not one of those that's accused of this very much, but there are some people that it's all about their feelings. Well, I just woke up this morning and and I had a feeling that I need to do this or that. Well, I'm not saying the Holy Spirit doesn't tell us things to do or not do sometimes. But sometimes it's just me and my feelings or old wives' tales that are leading me to do something or not do something. Our feelings, while they might lead us in the right direction sometimes... If my feelings are my final determination of what's right and wrong, I'm just going to tell you there are sometimes my feelings will lead me astray. And I would dare say, even if your feelings are a little better than mine, there are some times that your feelings are going to lead you down the wrong path too. I have plenty of folks I've known in my life, and you have too, that They always talk about having this feeling or that feeling. By the way, my mama sometimes says, I just have a feeling about this or that. And if my mama says that, I'm going to pay attention to it because a lot of times my, my mama's right if she says she has a feeling about this person or a feeling about that. But I'm going to tell you, my mama's not always right either. T.R., don't you dare tell your grandma that I said her feelings are not always right about stuff. But the reality is none of us 
Our feelings are always right about stuff. But you know what is always right? The words in this book. There's not a single jot nor tittle of any word in this book that isn't the very Word of God. And to the degree that I know what's in this book, and I live by what I know is in the book, that's what's right and wrong. By the way, it's right and wrong whether I know what's in there or not. So it's my job to dig in and find out what's in there. You can come to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and I hope you do, and let the preacher spoon feed you. But then the rest of the week you need to go home and you need to dig in for yourself. There are some people, they don't go by their feelings, but they go by their logic. Oh, preacher, I'm not one of those touchy-feely, emotional people. It's all about the logic behind it. I, that's probably what the preacher would be accused of. I'm probably more that kind of person than the touchy-feely person. But I'm going to tell you, you can go by your logic, your reasoning ability, all the time. It will lead you astray sometimes, too. However perfectly God created man's intellect when He put him in the Garden of Eden, it doesn't work the way it was intended to work in the Garden of Eden anymore because of sin and the effects of sin on the human body and the human brain. Adam named every animal in the garden, and the name he came up with for every animal was the perfect name to match that animal. I don't know how he did it. God gave him the intellect and he had the intellect to do it. I suspect that it's possible that Adam and Eve were able to communicate with the animals in a way that uh, Brother John can't communicate with his little baby dog that he loves so much at home. I know he, he talks to her and, and she understands a lot of what he said, but I kind of think Adam and Eve in the garden, they must have been able to communicate and interact with the, the creatures in the garden more than we can even fathom. I mean, after all, Eve didn't think it any big thing that a serpent was talking to her. Any woman today that had a serpent talk to her, what, what would she do? She'd take off running to the house, right? Well, Eve didn't do that. Either that or pass out, Mary said. So, so any woman today would have done that, but Eve didn't do that. So maybe they had the intellect to be able to do that. Our, our minds were not affected as mankind by the effects of sin at that point. But once sin entered into the world, and death by sin, for that sin passed upon all men, the game changed at that point. I can use my intellect to try to figure out what's right and wrong, and a lot of times it will be right. But you know what? It won't always be right. There are times that just rationalizing, using logic and reason, will lead you astray. There are things in this book that run contrary to the lost person's logic. There are. But it's still the truth. And it's still the standard by which we're going to be judged. Because you see, the lost person's brain doesn't work the way it's supposed to work. And even a saved person's brain doesn't work the way it did before the fall in the Garden of Eden. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I, I, I've heard it taught my whole life, and I think to some degree it's true, when God made man and woman to become one, He was putting together the perfect home, the perfect family for raising children, so he made us a little bit differently where both man and woman created in his image, but together we are complete and what children need in child raising. We both bear aspects of who God is. When you fell down and skinned your knee growing up, you ran to mama 
or grandma. Because the, the motherly affection and love and that emotional side, we need that nurturing. Our fathers, for the most part, I would say, are, are more logically minded, more rational about things in some situations. But they're supposed to be that way so that a child growing up has, has all of those attributes of God working together. But it doesn't matter whether you're man or woman, whether you're more this or more that, emotion or intellect or vice versa, doesn't matter. For neither of those will lead us to the right conclusions all the time. It's a lie from Satan. That I can decide what's right for myself. I don't need anybody else to tell me what's right or wrong. In James 1.26, the Bible says, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. You know, there are a lot of people that think they're religious. There are a lot of people who think they're all together. The Bible says some of them have deceived their own heart. They've fallen for the lies of the father of lies, and in turn they've deceived themselves. You've met some of those people, they think they're everything. They're the all to be all. Mankind thinks that he can figure out right and wrong without God. I remember when I was in college, one of the classes that I took was on comparative philosophy. It was on the different philosophies that mankind has come up with over these 6,000 years to determine what's right and what's wrong. One of those men that seemed the closest to the Bible, but wasn't a Christian, wasn't the Bible, was a German philosopher named Immanuel Kant. It was interesting that his name was Immanuel, because that means God with us, but as far as I know, he wasn't a Christian, wasn't born again, and he was trying to create a system of ethics that was right, but left God out. And Immanuel Kant taught something called the categorical imperatives. That is, he said, I do believe in absolute right and absolute wrong, but you don't have to believe in God to believe right and wrong are absolutes. Now, I believe in absolute right and wrong, and if you're a Christian, you should too. But you can't arrive at that without God. And no matter what a lost man says and tries to philosophize, <clears throat> If there is no God and there is no Creator, then you cannot end up with absolute values. Absolute right and wrong. But man thinks he can come up with how to determine what's right and wrong. But that whole, that whole class on comparative philosophy was on one different philosophy every other day in the class that was a, another man's views on how to determine right and wrong. Or another group's views on how to determine right and wrong. And then you, you end up at the end of the semester with a whole hodgepodge smorgasbord of man's ideas of how to arrive at what's right and what's wrong ethically. But none of them said, just go to the book. Just go to the book! Because man has believed one of the lies of Satan. I can decide what's right for myself. This one kind of goes along with it, but it's another lie. No one has a right to tell me how to live my life. I know you've heard that one. That one's in the news every day. Some group or another telling me, nobody has a right to tell me how to live my life. It's my body. It's my choice. And on and on we could go. It could be about any issue, really. I think about Samson in the Old Testament. The strongest man who's ever lived. But he had a rebellious heart. 
And he was going to do what he wanted to do with his life, not what God wanted him to do with his life. He ended up in the wrong company and lots of problems because of it. Because no one was going to tell him how to live his own life. Romans chapter 14 verses 7 and 8 say, No man liveth unto himself, and no man dieth unto himself. We don't live in a bubble. There are people around us that are affected. Which leads me to the next lie. My sin isn't hurting anyone. First of all, your sins are hurting you, whether you admit it or acknowledge it or care about it or not. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18, flee fornication, that is sinful sexual immorality, inside or outside of marriage. Flee fornication, every sin that a man committeth is without his body, but this sin is against his own body. It's not the only sin that a person can commit against themselves. But do you realize there are certain sins that when you commit them, you're not only committing them against God, you're committing them against sinning against other people and even sinning against yourself in certain cases. I've heard many people say, my sin isn't hurting anybody else. Maybe it hurts me, but that's my business. But my sins don't affect anybody else. But you and I both know people where that's not the case. We can both, in our own background, identify certain families where a certain family member's sins ended up affecting the rest of the family too. In Exodus 20, verse 5, the Bible says that the sins of the father are visited unto the third and fourth generations unto the children. You know some families. Maybe even your own family has been affected. I can think of individuals in my family who because of their sins, I'm thinking of cousins, Because of their sins, not only their parents, but their children and their grandchildren now have been affected by their sins 50 years ago. No, it's a lie to to believe that my sins aren't hurting anybody else. Because the choices I make do affect other people. It's a selfish lie, but it's a lie no less. I have some more, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna rush through them. Maybe I'll finish this message next week, or maybe I'll just put it in the file cabinet till some other time. But lies. There are so many lies that Satan has told that they've they've warped the thinking not only of the lost, but even of saved people. And if we allow ourselves and the way we think about things to be formed, formulated, shaped by things that are not true, by lies. Our lives will be in utter chaos. Those around us, their lives will be influenced by the chaos. So what's the solution? The Bible says in Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God. I'm not preaching a message this morning on the whole armor of God, but go read Ephesians 6. Put on the whole armor of God. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. I know a lot of Christians that they don't even bother putting up a resistance to the devil. They just go along with whatever he throws at them and they enjoy it in the meanwhile. And then Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Dear friends, we ought not be confused and conformed in the way we think to the world and the lies of the devil. We ought to be conformed to what this book says. It ought to determine how we think and believe about everything. And if it contradicts what Washington says, so be it. And it will a lot of the time. And if it contradicts what mama and daddy say, and it will sometimes, this book is still the final authority. And if it contradicts what the preacher says, this book is still the final authority. It ought to be the thing by which we view everything. I hope that any of us that have any views or values or beliefs about what's right and wrong that are not in line with this book, that we will honestly examine them and say, if they don't line up with this book, I need to change the way I've been thinking about some things. Maybe we even need to say, Lord, forgive me for allowing the way I think about this particular thing to be affected by what the world says instead of what the Bible says. Let's be conformed to the image of His Son, not the image of the world around us. Would you stand quietly and reverently to your feet, please, with heads bowed and eyes closed. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that all of us would endeavor to be what You want us to be. Lord, help us to have good works, not because we believe it's going to save our soul, but because if we belong to You, we ought to be good. We ought to want to be good. We ought to want to please you with our lives. So Lord, I pray that you'd be with all of my folks that are here this morning. Lord, see each and every one of their hearts and their lives. Lord, those that are saved, I pray, dear God, that they would make sure that the way they think about every issue is filtered through the Word of God. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that we would all be more of what we ought to be. Lord, that we would not hesitate to say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've been looking at that through my own prism of right and wrong. I want to look at it through your prism, the Word of God. Lord, help me to be the kind of witness, the kind of light to the world around us that I ought to be.